Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 14th in our wood design series. Today, we will be working through examples of, of applying what we have discussed in the previous few lectures. In previous videos, we have discussed how the NBS handles species groups, size classification, and structural risk. Today, we are going to see how to apply this. Namely, we will be exploring how to determine reference design values for sawn lumber structural elements. So we're going to be looking up reference design values, and we're going to be focused on uh, sawn lumber. While the process for this is conceptually relatively simple, I thought I would create a video that just walked through the steps anyway. Um, the difficult part in determining reference design values isn't determining the values themselves. The tricky part really is simply knowing uh, where to look. There are different tables to look up values depending on the specifics of size and species, and there are a few potential hurdles and stumbling blocks that we'll go through along the way. Now, I do want to go through a few caveats right off the bat. Um, first of all, this video is going to focus on getting the reference design values only. And these are not the final values you use in actual design. To see what I mean by this, consider table 4.3.1 from the uh, NDS. So, um, what you see here is table 4.3.1, and this, as it shows, is applicability of adjustment factors for sawn lumber. And so, uh, if you look at, say, FB prime here, FB pr the F sub B refers to bending stress, and you have this FB uh, times CD times CM times CI times CL times CF times CFU times CI times CR. Uh, again, and we have discussed this a bit in the past, but I just wanted to make sure to include this in the video itself in case any people stumbled out upon this got a little, a little confused. These in red are, the, are examples of the adjustment factors. Basically what these do is take the reference design values and adjust them for varying circumstances. Uh, for example, the CD low duration um, wood behaves differently depending on uh, how long you load it. So if you load it for a very long time, it's actually, uh, it deflects more, it, it uh, it's, uh, you know, sort of, it almost in the way that concrete creeps, it's kind of a similar process almost, but there's a time-dependent relationship between load and, um, and, and behavior or, and response. Um, CM is moisture content, uh, you know, areas that are getting repeatedly wet and dry, wet and dry, that's important. Temperature factor for very high temperature areas, etc. And there's a whole series of factors, and I'm not going to get to them today in this video, Rather, I'm going to have, uh, actually these are going to be the main topics we look at in the following lectures. So I'm going to have a video where I look at the load duration factor, I'm going to have a, load, uh, a video where I look at the wet service factor, etc. My goal is to have a uh, hopefully short video where I'll go over the theory and um, methodology behind each of these, and then I'll actually uh, look at combining them all together. So what we're actually looking at today, oh, let me delete that. What we are looking at today is just this. Um, so again, remember how I said what we do is we uh, start with a value and then we multiply by a series of adjustment factors to consider various uh, various specifics of the uh, where that element is used, how it's used, uh, and some other things, the length of a member, that sort of thing. Um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at how to get the base values or the reference design values. Because again, the whole idea with this is that you start with this base reference design value, the FB, for example, and then you multiply it by a series of uh, adjustment factors, and that gives you an FB prime. And an FB prime, um, FB prime, for example, is an adjusted allowable bending stress. And this is what you actually compare to the um, loads uh, that you're applying to your members. So, this, uh, the adjusted value is what you actually use in design. So uh, again, one more time, what we're doing here is all we're doing is discussing how to get the reference unadjusted values from um, the NDS supplement tables. And then you can't use these directly in design um, or direct, you have to uh, first apply a series of adjustment factors and um, then you have a value that you can actually use. So I hope I've made that abundantly clear. Um, we're only looking at getting the reference design values today, not looking at actually getting all of the adjustment factors. Um, 
if you try to use the reference value by itself without adjusting for it, well, you might kill somebody depending on um, the circumstances of your project. Although probably nine times out of your ten you're okay, but if you're in a uh, area that if you're if, if you try to do that with a member that's in high temperature and very wet conditions, well then you probably will have a problem. But anyway, so if you uh, if you kill somebody because you um, uh, just chose to ignore the disclaimer, uh, that is on you. <laughs> anyway, um, that is always the danger of structural engineering. So. Um, again, we're just looking at the reference design values today. We're going to look up um, where to find these in various tables. We're going to work through a series of examples, and uh, that will be the topic for uh, today's material. Um, and the second caveat is that we are going to be looking only at sawn lumber today. Um, there are certainly other lumber products out there. Uh, for example, glue lamb members have their own reference design values and their own tables for determining those. However, uh, these other products have their own special considerations, and we here are going to focus uh, just on sawn lumber products today. Again, we're going to be looking at finding the reference design values of sawn lumber products. All right, with those disclaimers out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is going to be our first problem of the evening, um, and this is going to be determine the reference design values for a 2x6 uh, DFL number 2 grade. So. Uh, DFL is Douglas for large, and the grade we're looking at is number two. So what are the pieces of information we need? Well, we do need the grade, we have that. We need the species group, DFL meaning Douglas for large, and we need the size, or more specifically the size category, a two by six. Well, the two by six is the size, we need to use that to figure out the size category. And the size category for this, uh, because it's a two, because the narrowest side has a nominal dimension um, less than or equal to four inches, we know then that this is a um, dimensional lumber product rather than a beam and timber or post and stern. So again, because uh, because the two inch width is uh, less than or equal to four inches, and again, nominal not actual width um, is less than or equal to four inches, we know that this is dimensional lumber. And because of that, we then can go to table um, 4A in the NDS supplement. So let's go ahead and pull that up and look at the uh, look at the title of uh, this table here. This is table 4A in the NDS supplement. Reference design values for visually graded dimensional lumber, two inches to four inches thick. Um, just as we mentioned, um, and again that's that would be nominal dimensions. And if we look at the the footnotes, uh, oh, this will also be fun. So, actually, let's see if we can find the footnotes. Those are always fun to read. Well, fun from a certain definition. There, there's always some things uh, uh, hidden, uh, or some things that, uh, there are sometimes important things that are kind of sort of hidden, well, not really hidden, but uh, you do need to pay special attention to the, uh, the asterisks in any design uh, specification, and the NDS is no exception here. So, it gives you some... Uh, items here. These are the dry dress sizes, nominal dimensions, some different things for uh, stress-rated boards. Um, when individual species or species groups are combined, the design values to be used for the combination shall be the lowest design value for each individual species or species group for each design category. Interesting. Okay, so uh, the use for this combination. So basically if you're using, uh, this is basically saying that if you're using a variety of different species, uh, or different species groups, uh, you have to use the lowest design value if you're not separating the designs. Um, okay. Also, one other note. Notice what this says here. Um, this uh, mentions all species except southern pine. Uh, see table 4b. And this is one of the odder elements of the NDS, because uh, um, in the reference design values, uh, Literally every other U.S. wood species is in this table. Every other commercial wood species is in this table. Everything except southern pine. And the reason for the, the reasons for that are very complicated, but basically what, what it amounts to is that... Um, I should almost put a video... I probably should put a video together on that for historical curiosity, if nothing else. But um, the uh, reason for that is that the NDS, you really, uh, if you look at the history of it, it's like... It sort of, it coalesced together from a lot of separate um, sources, a lot of separate grading agencies, that sort of thing. 
and most were able to kind of merge together eventually, but um, they were able to get everything in one specification, but there were some special things about how um, how uh, southern pine was uh, graded and handled, and uh, some of the factor, some of the adjustment factors applied to it. And because of that, it, it's those are retained got out of really um, uh, out of uh, camaraderie. That's not the right word. Out of uh, professional courtesy. Out of I don't know. Um, every, the thing is, uh, in any industry, people who are involved in that industry are really passionate about how they do things. That's pretty typical of anyone who is skilled at a craft or profession. And um, for whatever reason, when the different uh, regional lumber manufacturers came together over the decades to put the specification together, um, the Southern Pine, uh, you know, uh, logging associations and manufacturers associations just uh, couldn't get it. There, there was just so much enough friction there that they couldn't, in the end, uh, get everything to match up. So um, because of that, Southern Pine is now its own special flower child. And um, for every species except Southern Pine, we're going to use Table 4A. Again, for this is dimensional lumber. But if we're going to use Southern Pine, then we'll go to Table 4B. So again, uh, uh, Table, or uh, not Table, uh, Southern Pine is its own unique special snowflake. So it gets its own special um, uh, table in the NDS supplement. Anyway. So uh, let's go ahead and go down to the species group. Again, we're looking at Douglas fir. Well, Douglas fir large specifically. And notice I have three potential species groups here. I see this Douglas fir large. I see this Douglas I see this Douglas fir large, this Douglas fir large north, and this Douglas fir large south. So how do I know which one to use? Well, um, the key is that if I look at my problem statement, it said just Douglas fir large. It didn't say if I go back here, it didn't say uh, uh, Douglas fir uh, large south. Or D that would be like a DFL dash S or a DFL dash N for Douglas fir, Douglas fir large north. Um, sometimes there are regional varieties of these different things, and unless you specifically see that uh, one of the regional varieties called out, you should always just assume the uh, you should always assume the uh, default one, the standard one. Um, and Douglas for large is sort of the standard one, and then there are regional varieties for the north and the south varieties. Okay, so uh, I now have the species group. Um, and again, if you uh, can't remember what a species group is, please see the video on uh, species groups. Went in, uh, and I went and uh, in great detail discussed why we have species groups, what they're useful for, how they're put together, that sort of thing. Okay. And we're looking at um, number two here. Oh, I just highlighted number three. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy these on over to my SMATH page. So we have FB, that's gonna be equal to 900 PSI. Uh, we have our FT, our reference allowable tension stress of, eight, of uh, 575. Uh, we have FB, our reference allowable uh, shear stress, which is going to be 180 PSI. Uh, compression stress perpendicular to grain, that's our FC perp. And where did that go? Did this for large number two, highlighting the number three. That is going to be 625 PSI. And then next is the compression parallel to grain, which is just designated FC. And that's gonna be 1350 PSI. Uh, the elastic modulus is going to be uh, uh, 1,600,000 PSI. And the stress is 1,600,000 PSI. And as a reminder, you can find uh, copies of the NDS and the NDS supplements uh, on uh, the web for free, read-only versions, um, although they don't include the commentaries, which are 
useful if you want to uh, do things like, I don't know, like create a YouTube series or something. Um, but if you're just looking for the basic tools of design, you can find the NDS and the NDS supplement digitally available for free on the um, uh, American Wood Council's website. And G, the specific gravity, 0 0.50. So let me just double check these values. I have them entered in my SJET math sheet that I'll show shortly again. Uh, 0 0.5, 580,000. 160,000, or sorry, 1,600,000, uh, 1,350, 625, 180, 575, and 900. And again, here's the uh, headers here. And if I scroll on back to my, um, to my SMATH page, they are visible here. So again, my bending stress, my reference uh, allowable bending stress is 900 psi. Uh, the tension stress parallel to grain, 575, shear stress parallel to grain, 180, uh, etc., working its way on down. And again, let's think about what these values actually represent. As we discussed previously, these already have your factors of safety uh, and your, uh, your factors of safety for, um, for uh, ASD procedures baked into them. So, for example, for the uh, number two uh, Douglas fir larch, when it says bending stress is 900, uh, that does not mean that if I were to buy a hundred uh, different boards and load them, if I were to buy a hundred different two by sixes out of number two grade DFL, if I bought a hundred of them and actually tested their bending strength uh, at failure or the elastic limit or something, I wouldn't find uh, that the average is 900 PSI. That's not the average failing stress. Rather, there's a whole bunch of other um, bits of uh, adjustments, just a, lot of, a whole lot of statistics that goes into these numbers. Basically how these are determined is the researchers um, start with uh, actual lab data, your uh, actual, you know, literally just taking a bunch of these types of members and breaking them and measuring the stresses. Um, and then they use statistical tools based on things like the consequences of failure, uh, redundancy of the structure, and all of the things we looked at in the previous uh, lecture uh, discussing risk and structural risk and sources of risk, um, they are include within all of these are varying levels of factors of safety uh, designed to take that into account. And again, these are the ASD factors of safety, or sorry, the ASD reference design values. If you want to then do LRFT, there's two other factors that you have to multiply by. Um, then, uh, but I'm not going to show that in this video. I think I might show that in a follow-up video. Um, and again, um, be aware that, uh, again, as we discussed at the start of this lecture, these are the unadjusted, um, reference design values. These are, uh, used to actually use these, you then have to multiply, uh, by all of the relevant factors, you know, uh, that we discussed, uh, briefly at the beginning. All right, let's consider now problem two. I buy a four x four Western cedar post from a pile graded number two and better. Find its reference design values. So uh, first of all, we'll need to know what kind of uh, size classification this is. And uh, the, the narrowest uh, dimension is gonna be four inches nominal. Nominal, but not actual, of course. And because of that, this is still going to be dimensional lumber. Right, so that's still dimensional lumber. Now, in terms of what table to use, well, because we know it's dimensional lumber, we know it's going to either be, uh, and also because it's sawn lumber, we know that it's going to be either uh, table 4A or table 4B. And knowing whether to use table 4A or 4B is just going to come, uh, is just going to come down to the question, uh, is this southern pine or is this not southern pine? And because it's western cedar, this is definitely not western, or sorry, this is definitely not uh, southern pine. So we're going back to table uh, uh, 4a here. So let's go back to table 4a. And uh, let's see, so we want to scroll down to the species group. Uh, western cedars, western juniper, spruce pine for north. Um, and here we have western cedars. Now, um, there is a reason I phrased this uh, there's a reason I phrased this problem just as I did. I said I buy it from a pile uh, labeled number two and better. If I look at the grades here, I don't see any grade labeled number two and better. 
rather what this means is this is how lumber is sometimes or actually often sold in lumber yards and home centers and things like that oftentimes you'll see things um uh where there where a pile or a shipment of lumber they're not necessarily going to the trouble of an expense of separating everything into exactly okay this is grade number one this is grade number two this is grade number three rather what they're doing is they're saying okay well um we're not going to go through all the trouble of sorting everything into exact, perfect, discrete grades, but what we do guarantee is everything in this pile is number two or better. So in other words, if I buy something from that pile, it could be a number two, it could be a number one, it could even be up at select structural, um, but it won't be down at like stud, number three, construction standard, or utility. So how do I handle this? What I, I, I don't actually know what grade of lumber this is. I just know that it's number two and better. So it could be number two, it could be another one, it could be a select structural. And uh, the way we handle this is that we just are, are conservative. Uh, we ch if we have a situation where we could have um, more than one potential grade, we simply choose the uh, lowest values or the lowest, uh, the weakest or lowest stresses and mo elastic modulus for uh, each of the potential grades that it might be. So number two, not surprising, is going to be the lowest, uh, weakest grade here. So we are going, so that even though this is number two and better, and even though uh, it might actually be a number one or a select structural, we're just gonna use the values for the number two. So I'm gonna say the uh, reference file vending stress is 700 PSI. The tension stress is 425 PSI. Uh, the shear stress is 155. Uh, shear stress is 155 PSI. The compression perpendicular to crane is 425 PSI. The compression parallel to crane is 850 PSI. Uh, the elastic modulus is uh, 1 million PSI. And the minimum elastic modulus is 370,000. And then the specific gravity, cedar being a light wood, is not surprising that that G is of a low value of 0.36. So checking my value, so always be sure to check your values. Checking over, I have 0.36, 370,000, 1 million, 600 and, no, sorry, uh, oh, typo, I have 850 here, it's actually 650, and that is why it's good to always check your values. And I totally didn't make a mistake there, that was me just, uh, just, uh, putting a mistake in the work purposely so that I could illustrate the importance of, uh, checking your values, sure, we'll go with that. Um, the, uh, compression perpendicular is 425. The uh, shear stress parallel to grain, or just shear stress, is 155, uh, and the units again are PSI. The tension stress is 425, and the bending stress is 700. Also, I probably should mention, um, why do we have these two different elastic modulus, the E and the E min? Well, this will come up later, but um, in later discussions, later videos, but um, basically they're used for different purposes. The There can be a... a Wood as a biological material is very complex, and uh, you can get quite a range actually of elastic modulus. So this value is used more when you want sort of a typical value for a species group. This is a minimum value um, that you're sure it almost never will go below. And they can so if you're using something that the if you're doing like a safety calculation, um, uh, like the the safety relied on a certain elastic modulus on a very critical element you'd probably use the E-min for this, um, et cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's the basic idea. Basically, they're, they're both elastic modulus, but because of the uh, variance, um, you might be intended to use this one more for, say, example, deflection calculations, and this one more for, like, uh, column buckling or something. And we will look at that later when we get to discussing those types of numbers. All right, let's now consider problem three here. Uh, find the reference design values for a number, oh, uh, would be a number two, uh, southern pine two by eight. 
So in terms of the uh, lumber product, this is uh, its narrowest dimension is two inches nominal. So that means that this is a dimensional lumber product. We're not yet into the uh, heavier bits, uh, the heavier, larger sections, posts and timbers, beams and stringers, that sort of thing. Oh, and I suppose if, per if I want to be complete, I should probably put that, I had a spot for reference table here. So that's that was for A. And this is also 4A. There, now that's complete. Okay. So looking at this, um, we know it's dimensional lumber and we know it's southern pine. So we looked at table 4A before this and that was all dimensional lumber except uh, southern pine. And that's table 4A. And then table 4B is going to be dimensional lumber uh, southern pine and other related species. So let's go to the PDF here, and here we're still at 4A, and we'll talk about uh, this type of thing, these uh, repetitive use factors and size factors and everything else. We'll, we'll get to that, don't worry. Um, so we're looking at Southern Pine, just regular old Southern Pine right now, and um, at first it might be tempting just to jump down to say, oh, here, here, Southern Pine, number two, I can just use these values right here. I found a number two Southern Pine, what's the problem? Well, uh, Southern Pine is a, the table is going to be set up a little bit differently than what we saw in um, uh, the previous uh, table with looking at the other species other than Southern Pine. Uh, the way it, there's some differences in how this table is organized. So, this table is organized uh, even within just the Southern Pine species. There are a whole bunch of other I should say, I should say species group, not species. Um, there are a whole bunch of other categories, and it's sorted by width, um, by the actual width of the member. So, um, and this means the wider side. So, um, since we have a two by eight, um, now don't you, you wouldn't want to use two inches wide because, uh, by definition, uh, in uh, lumber nomenclature, the narrower dimension would be referred to as the thickness, and the the larger dimension of the cross section would be referred to as a width. So a two by eight has a nominal thickness of two inches and a nominal width of eight inches. So we want to go down here to the eight inch wide uh, row here or section. Then looking at number two, and at first uh, well, we might we might uh, uh, at first or maybe uh, at, have some passing temptation to go to the number two dense, but that is a separate grade than the number two or the number two non dense. Um, so if I just say number two with no other information, I should just assume the standard number two. Um, definitely not the number two dense and the number two non-dense, unless you actually have something labeled like that, is probably being over conservative. Although, I mean, if you want to be conservative, there's nothing really preventing that. Just means your design is going to be a little bit heavier than it should be otherwise. So bending stress, we have 925 PSI, uh, tension stress, parallel to crane, 550, 550 PSI, and um, you may note here that there is tension parallel to grain, but there's not any tension perpendicular to the grain. And if you remember back to our previous discussions of wood strength versus uh, direction, um, we assume that wood has zero strength uh, in tension perpendicular to grain, because when you're pulling with the grain or parallel to the grain, you're pulling on individual straws or fibers of the wood. When you're pulling perpendicular to grain, you're trying to separate those straws or fibers from each other. Okay, and then our shear stress is 175 PSI. Our compressive stress perpendicular to grain, 565 PSI. Uh, compressive stress parallel to grain, that's going to be uh, 1350 PSI. Our, our sort of stamped graded elastic modulus is 140,000 PSI, and our minimum elastic modulus is 510,000 PSI. And then our specific gravity is 0 0.55. And the specific gravity, again, is of course just the ratio of the density of the material to the density of water. So this is, uh, at 0.55, this is a little over half the density of water. Um, so we're looking at so let me check my numbers, 0.55, 510,000, 140,000, 1350, 565, 
175, 550, and 925. And going back to my S math sheet, I have uh, these values here. So we have, oh, and I should probably go ahead and on this note, what reference table I'm using. It's always good when creating kind of sheet like this calculation sheet to include what reference you're using. So I'm going to reference table 4B for this one. All right, now let's look at this problem four. Find the references, uh, find the reference design values for a M14 DFL two by four. Huh, M14, that is odd. That doesn't sound like any of the grades we've discussed. That doesn't look like a, you know, a grade one or a grade two or anything like that. What on earth is an M14? Well, we're actually moving to a different table now and we're gonna be looking at table uh, 4C in the NDS supplement. So let's go ahead and pull that up. Um, table 4C, and we're still on 4B, so let's scroll down to table 4C. And we see two different sections uh, based on different rating agencies and methodologies, but this is what I wanna get at here, the M's. So what this means is, uh, so design values from a mechanically graded dimensional lumber. Everything uh, we've talked about and most of the lumber you'll use in say traditional stick frame building is visually graded. Although some is mechanically graded, but mostly you're using visually graded. And that's exactly what it sounds like. You know, you have somebody who is trained in the process of um, uh, grading uh, various lumber species and types and grades and sizes and they will be uh, hot posted at a lumber mill and will just manually take a quick glance at each uh, they're, they're good they're skilled enough that they can as you know literally you have to imagine somebody on an assembly line um, looking at a piece of lumber for a fraction of a second and putting a little mark on it with a piece of chalk or something because that's literally how fast they operate and um, so you have to think of something like that but um, now that's fine, and we've discussed how that works and how you account for that in terms of safety and reliability and all the statistics involved, but there is another way. Um, see, the thing about doing that is that while that is a time and cost efficient way of, of uh, creating some sort of reliability from an otherwise highly variable product such as wood, um, it is not uh, necessarily uh, the most efficient in terms of material. Because if you're doing something like that, you have to do, uh, if you're using like visually grading for all of its, um, uh, for all of its speed, it's going to have certain um, imprecision. Because you are, you know, when you visually grade a piece of lumber, you're almost literally judging a book by its cover. You are looking at, you can only look at or what was on the outside surface. There may be defects hidden within, uh, a defect that looks like it's very large on the surface might actually be very small and or a defect that looks like it goes all the way through a piece of lumber might actually just be a thin surface layer that doesn't affect its strength that much. So, I mean, when you are visually grading lumber, you are literally judging a book by its cover. Although I suppose you're literally judging something you could make a book out of and then judge its cover. But anyway, you are judging the piece of uh, lumber only by what you can see. You're not sitting there with a, you know, an X-ray machine and looking inside it that way. Another way of doing this is uh, mechanically graded lumber. And the way, and this is exactly what it sounds like. They'll take individual pieces of lumber and directly put each and every single one of them um, it, through a series of tests to measure their bending strength, their tension strength, their compression parallel to grain, and their elastic modulus. Now, they don't just, um, they don't, you know, load it up until the point of failure. They have a way of, you know, some equations that like, okay, well, if it, bends this much at this level of stress and a predicted failure level is this much. So there's a little bit, there may be a little bit of extrapolation going on there, but um, it's still a very uh, sound methodology. But the real power of it is that they literally put every single member, every single piece of lumber, every single piece of wood that is sold with a stamp like this is directly tested in a machine. And so you don't need to say, okay, across this big wide species group of, you know, half dozen different species and this grade that will cover many different possible things and it's broad enough to be accurately gauged within, you know, just looking at it in a fraction of a second, we are going to directly test each individual piece of lumber and 
Um, if it gets a bending stress of 1200 PSI, we're going to put it in the, and meets the other classifications, we'll put it in the M7. If it has 13, we'll give it an M8. If it has 1100, we'll give it an M6. So they just test all of them and then um, put them in a category depending on what they actually measure. So different species could end up with different grades just depending on, or even even different sp different pieces from the same tree could end up with very different ratings um, just depending on how their um, how the actual tests work out. So um, this here, we asked for a M14 DFL 2x4. Now we should check the size classification, two inch and less in thickness. Um, we're looking at a two by four, so that is that marks this box, or that meets the first criteria because it is two inch and less in thickness. It's two inches in thickness and two inches and wider. So in order to use this table, you have to meet both of these, these size qualifications. And because we had a two by four, that is two inches and wider. Then looking at the M14, Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, write these down. We have a bending stress of 1800 PSI, a tension parallel to crane of 1000 PSI. Now, there's a few values missing. Uh, we don't see the shear parallel to crane and the compression perpendicular to crane. What we do have is compression parallel to crane, and that is 1750 PSI. And the elastic modulus is 1,700,000. And again, I mentioned how they will um, put them in different uh, in these different grades depending on um, the, the results of tests. And in case you can't uh, guess, the way they handle all these is um, they always base it on the weakest tests. In other words, if um, if a given piece of wood meets grade 13 requirement or meets a uh, grade 14 requirements for bending, but only meets grade 13 requirements for tension, they'll put it in the uh, grade 13. It's just based on, you know, the weakest link type thing. So this, a chain is weak, its weakest link. So, um, you know, you could have a piece that you're buying in M12, for example, and it's rated for 1600, but it, it's uh, actual measured stress, uh, actual measured bending stress might have been 1800 if it's tensile capacity just a bit lower um, than was needed for the other crate. Again, these are minimum values, not average or maximum. Okay, and then um, let's see, for the E-min, we had uh, 790,000. So again, on the M14, uh, 790,000 on the min, 1,700,000, 1, 1,750, uh, 1,000, and 1,800. Okay, so then the question becomes, where do we get the other values? And why are some values left out? Well, the reason for this is that as we go through uh, the course, we will see that these values, or these uh, these types of stresses, bending, tension parallel to the grain, compression parallel to the grain, and elastic modulus, these are the things that tend to be most critical in actually designing, um, especially things like tension and compression members, flexure members, that sort of thing. The other ones can be more important, especially when you get into things like um, connection design. But um, in, if you look at, for example, in beam design, uh, shear is something you'll check just to make sure, but it almost never controls. Um, just the nature of what is material and the cross-sectional sizes and things, um, the beams tend to almost always be controlled by bending failure rather than shear failure. So you, you typically design for bending and then you check shear and deflection. And so um, you'll, you know, you'll actually, you'll, I mean, you have to check the shear just to make sure you're not overstressing it, but it's not uncommon to have beams that are um, operating at, you know, 90%, you, you design them for, well, inc obviously including factors of safety and things that, you know, you're operating them up near the limit of your allowable um, uh, bending uh, moment capacity, but they may have you know, five times the amount of shear capacity they need, simply because shear doesn't t doesn't tend to be something we control for. So, because of that, the thing about testing is that, especially mechanical testing, is that you have to test every one of these things, and every one of these properties is going to require more testing. And so, if you want to uh, note directly on the shear value for each of these, 
then what you're going to have to do is you're going to, to also you're going to have to also check the shear that you measure the shear and the compression perpendicular to grain for each of these. So this is just more ex more tests, more work, more equipment um, to get this mechanical rating done. And since um, mechanical rating is since again these things almost never control, it, what is easier actually is to um, uh, rely on the grading only for those qualities. I'll rely on the direct mechanical grading only for those qualities that are um, that are most critical in design. And the others are taken care of just by sort of minimum values that you would have for general grades. So for example, we had Douglas fir larch and our modulus of elasticity was 170,000. Um, so let's look here. Now this is actually kind of interesting. So um, we'll see here that the, uh, <laughs> this is actually kind of interesting in that the, um, the uh, uh, NDS supplement here is actually giving us two different values. And this is again one of those weird things that comes from the complicated history of the NDS. So um, looking here, there are actually two different values, uh, there are different sections of this table that we can get uh, values for the other properties of Douglas fir larch um, mechanically graded lumber. So uh, for now for the, uh, so what, what we have here is the WWPA and the WCLIB. And these are two uh, uh, lumber grading agencies and different sawmills will operate according to one or the other, or maybe uh, maybe switch back and forth depending on where they're selling their product, that sort of thing. Um, or maybe they'll try to, op try to meet multiple at once. But um, basically different, I mean, these are private organizations. It's not like these are government organizations. They are private organizations and they have, um, you know, different people looking at different sets of data um, and or even the same set of data can come to different conclusions. And um, so um, there are slightly different, there are slight differences in the methodologies to do your uh, mechanical testing here, slight differences in how the grades are set up, that sort of thing between these two. They're very close, but they're not close enough that they were able, able to get them to match up perfectly through some sort of negotiation process or something. So what this means is that if you're looking at a if you're looking at a M14 or just any kind of mechanically graded lumber um, that is has its uh, rating um, process determined by the WWPA, you use the top set of values here. If you're using anything from WCALIB, you use something you use uh, use things from the section here. Lovely, isn't it? Isn't wood a wonderful material to work with? Um, and so, since we are, uh, since our elastic modulus was 170,000 psi, that means we're either in uh, this gray row, uh, the top gray row here, or the other top gray row. Now, um, I didn't tell us which one to use, so when in doubt, I will assume a conservative value. So, if I really wanted to get that extra amount of strength, you know, if I had a piece of lumber and, and um, hopefully this, the ratings agency was stamped right on there, but if it wasn't, maybe I could call up the sawmill and figure out exactly what the rules grading agency is. But when in doubt, I can always just choose at the lower value. So looking at the two of these, well, 170 is lower than 180, and since I don't know which one this was uh, graded under, I'm just gonna choose the lowest value to be conservative, and that will be 170 PSI um, for the shear parallel to grain. And that's the value I would use for design. Well, after applying a bunch of factors, of course, that we'll discuss in later videos. Then, uh, and again, the way I'm getting this is it's based on the elastic modulus. Uh, we determined that the elastic modulus from the previous part of the table was 1.7 times 10 to the 6 PSI or 170 million. So it falls within this first category, the first gray box line here. And then, uh, then our, uh, and then choosing between the two different shear values, I choose to go with the lowest one just to be uh, uh, just to be conservative because I don't know whether this is based on the WWPA or the WCLIB. Now, uh, thankfully, I don't have to make that decision for the um, for the compression perpendicular to grain because there's the same for both. That's six twenty five psi. Uh, six twenty five psi, and then the specific gravity. 
is going to be 0 0.5. And I always thought this is interesting, looking at the specific gravity versus the elastic modulus, because you can really see here how variable wood as a material is. Because like, um, consider something like steel. I mean, steel may have different, or does have very different strengths, but, um, you know, depending on what kind of uh, percent of um, carbon you have, depending on what various little, uh, you know, alloying elements you put in there, chromium and copper and all sorts of other things like manganese and all sorts of fun things. But what's interesting, while the actual, um, and also varying things based on heat treatment and tempering and, oh my god, I'm going off on a steel tangent. Okay. Um, uh, while the strength, the, the yield strength and the ultimate strength of uh, steel will vary, the density doesn't actually vary that much. The density is pretty much uh, the same. Now, uh, the value I always keep in my head is 490 pounds per cubic foot, and everyone who speaks metric just screamed. But um, so uh, I uh, memorize things in English units because uh, that's what we do in Freedom Land here in America. <laughs> okay, um, so let's see. Um, looking at but looking at wood here, we see that not only does the strength vary. Or in this case, I should, say, I should say the stiffness, not the strength of the elastic modulus, but the specific gravity, the density, also varies. This this wood here is ten times as dense as this wood here. I just thought that's always really cool, and we'll see later that that actually has certain implications for strength as well. There are there are actually some design formulas in the NDS that rely on the specific gravity um, in calculating certain properties. Anyway, that will, I, think, I think that will do it for this particular uh, problem. All right, next let's consider this example. Uh, problem five, consider the reference design values for a number two grade uh, six by eight made of red oak. <laughs> red oak, interesting. Well, that can't be terribly common. That's definitely not your typical uh, uh, tree plantation, tree farm. Um, mass-produced uh, softwood, but uh, there may be some cases where you might have that and you want to use that, so let's go ahead and give that a try. So, uh, first of all, it is going to be a, uh, this is going to be something that is larger than dimensional lumber. It's definitely not, um, it's definitely not dimensional lumber because its narrowest dimension is six inches nominal, so that means we're not going to be using tables uh, 4A, 4B, or 4C in the NDS supplement. Instead, we're going to be looking at table 4D. Okay, let's go ahead and pull that up. Oh, I should probably also erase these. These were copied from the previous one. I will get rid of these really quick. Well, that should, actually, that should have PSI on it, shouldn't it? To be, if we want to be 100% proper on this. Uh, there. Okay, very good. Oh, and PSI on this as well. That is the units for, or those are the units for modulus of elasticity. Okay, so we're going to go to table 4D now. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So, uh, these are the adjustment factors, some of the adjustment factors, but uh, anyway, we're going to go down uh, to there's, there is a section specifically for red oak. Oh, look at this. Hmm. Well, we have the number two grade. That's not a problem. But here's the question. There's two different number two grades. Hmm. And there, it's based on the size classification. And we have beams and stringers and posts and timbers. Now, in a previous lecture, we discussed the difference between these. And this is where it is really important. So this is the first place that we see where it's very important. Um, so. If you're use if you're using oh well, it's not probably the first place I think we saw it a bit in the discussions over safety as well but anyway um, and risk and such but um, posts and timbers so for example look here for number two at with the posts and timbers the bending stress is 575 for the beams and stringers it's 725 interesting same grade same species but different values and in fact that was actually sort of the uh, um, one of the things that I referred to, and I started the previous video out as referring to as sort of a paradox, 
why these values are different. And there's a, if you really want to listen to the whole thing and want a really thorough explanation, that video ended up being about two and a half hours long, going into all the various reasons why those numbers can be different. Suffice to say, there's a lot going on in this NDS table. So, um, let's see. Um, but what we need to do is we just need to figure out which category we're in. Are we in beams and stringers and we're in po or are we in posts and timbers? We know we're not in dimensional lumber land because we're not dealing with a, um, a, th a elements that has the narrow, a narrowest dimension uh, less than or equal to four inches. So uh, we're dealing with something, we're dealing with a pretty hefty wooden section that, ha that, it, that we have a six by eight. So it's six by eight. So it's narrowest dimension six inches is greater than uh, four inches. If it was four by eight, it would still actually be a dimensional lumber. Um, or a piece of dimensional lumber. Now, if you remember back to some previous discussions, um, let me actually just write this out, maybe. Um, well, actually, I'll go ahead and put this back into SMath. Let's review the definition of a post and timber and a beam and stringer. So I'm just going to call this, I'm just going to put a little text box here and say PNT versus BNS. Well, the main difference here is that, uh, again, both have, I'll say both have a uh, narrowest dimension greater than four inches, but the uh, uh, BNS, the, B the beam and stringer classification, size classification, uh, has one dimension at least, and that's key at least two inches greater actually i shouldn't say at least it's, it, the actual classification is more uh two inches or i should say one dimension more than two inches greater than its other dimension so um two inches or more greater or sorry not two inches more just two inches greater Maybe I can just actually illustrate this by some examples. So if you have a four by eight, as we mentioned, this would be a uh, just dimensional lumber uh, because uh, narrowest is uh, nearest dimension uh, is uh, four inches or less. What about a, let's say a, six by 12. Well, that's going to be a beam and stringer um, because narrowest is greater than four inches and depth is more than two inches larger than width. A What about a six by six? That would be a post and timber. Um, and I can probably just copy some of this to save a little bit of time. Because narrow dimension greater than four inches and depth is um, equal or, uh, let's say, how do I want to say this? Uh, is no more. That's a good way to say that. Depth is no more than two inches larger than the width. And finally, let's look at the actual case we're considering here, a six by eight. Actually, I'll put it in the same text box. Uh, six by eight. Well, if I can manage to type the number eight properly, um, this is going to actually be a, even though it is, um, even though it has a depth greater than its width, it's the difference is two inches exactly. It's not more than two inches. And because of that, this is going to be a post and timber. Uh, because narrowest dimension greater than four inches and depth is two inches larger than width, AKA falls in uh, no more than two inches uh, category. So 
as long as the, in, in other words, basically what you do is you, you take the depth and subtract the width or the larger dimension minus the smaller dimension. And as, if that is two inches or less, it's going to be a post and timber. If it's going to be a, um, if it's going to be a, uh, if it's more than that, then it's going to be a beam and sterner. If I wanted to, actually, if I wanted to be really fancy, I could construct this in S math to actually do a bit of logic, but I think this video is going to be long enough. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so we have, so we now know which of these it is. So let's go ahead and actually uh, uh, look up these values. So we know that it's a post and timber because uh, the dement the depth is only two inches greater than the width. Not, and if it was even a little bit more, it would be a beam and a stringer. But because it's not, it isn't. Okay. So going back here, we're looking at red oak select structure, not select structural number two. This time, posts and timbers. And looking at our values, it's just going to be a straightforward exercise in copying those over. So FB, the bending stress, is going to be 575 PSI. Uh, tension parallel to grain is going to be 400 PSI. Uh, the shear stress is going to be 150 PSI, or 155 PSI. Um, the, shear, the stress perpendicular to grain, or the compression stress perpendicular to grain, is going to be 820 PSI. Uh, compression parallel to grain is going to be 350. Whoa. Interesting. Huh. That is really low. That... Honestly, that's a bit impressive, actually. I've never seen that much of a difference. Uh, usually I'm used to the compression parallel to grain being higher. Um, and this one is actually much lower. I guess red oak must have some unique st uh, structural properties. Um, that would be interesting to read up on, and um, if this video already wasn't becoming uh, ridiculously overlong, um, I would maybe look into that, but uh, maybe that would be something for y'all to look up. Why is the uh, compression stress per uh, parallel to grain for red oak uh, number two so much lower than it's perpendicular to grain? Normally you expect the parallel to grain to be higher, but it's a an enigma. Um, and then uh, 370,000 PSI here. And then finally, a specific gravity of 0.67, which doesn't vary between the um, post and stringers and uh, beam, I'm oh, sorry, the uh, post and timbers and beams and stringers. So checking my numbers, I always like to double check on putting them into my sheet properly. Uh, the G is 0.67. The uh, elastic modulus min 370,000. 370, the E is 1 million. The FC is 350 psi. The FC perpendicular is 820. Uh, the shear is 155. The tension is 400. And the uh, bending stress is 575. And if I pop back on over to my S math sheet, you can find this here. And I suppose I haven't mentioned, uh, I think I've mentioned this in previous videos in the series, what SMATH is. It's just a uh, freeware uh, calculation program. It's very similar to um, MathCAD and some other similar programs. Uh, you can, um, uh, it's, its benefit is, its primary benefit is that it is freeware. You can download it for free. It's not open source, unfortunately, but it is freeware. So you can go ahead and download that if you're interested. Also, I do have a series of videos, a playlist on my channel about uh, sort of getting started on SMATH and learning how to use it and learning some of its basic functions, and etc. And so those are our basic values there. All right, and finally, I'm, uh, I've looked at all of the examples that I'm going to work through, but I do want to just go ahead and end with a few just random notes. Um, first of all, Southern Pine, uh, oh, actually, this is, uh, this is all uh, done for wet service conditions, so you'd actually have to back calculate the original values if you wanted those. So. Um, and we'll talk about the moisture content, and not, or not moisture content, the wet service uh, factor in another video. But um, I do like to point out that even in this one table, so um, for the dimensional number, there's a separate table entirely for um, Southern Pine. There's a, a table that's just Southern Pine. Um, but for the larger members that are five inch five and larger, um, Southern Pine is included, but just as before, I do find it very interesting um, in the view that I'm using that uh, Southern Pine still has to be special. And so um, 
as almost everything else is separated into beams and stringers and posts and timbers, southern pine is not, because reasons. So, um, and they also have this number two, number two, number two dense classification system. So, southern pine is its own unique animal, and so uh, it gets its own special formatting, even to, even if it doesn't get justify its own uh, completely unique table in this case. Okay, and then there are a couple other reference design value tables. Uh, there's table uh, 4E, our reference design values for visually graded decking. Decking is another type of, uh, of product that we don't really talk about much in this course, that I'm, that I'm not going to talk about much in this course, simply because it's it's not something necessarily directly related to a lot of the types of structures uh, that I'm instructing for. Um, it's used more in, well, it's decking, it's laid down. Um, uh, not really on necessarily on a this is more like commercial decking rather than like a you know the deck you'd have on the back of your house or something it's a little bit different so um, and these also have a lot of factors baked into them that we haven't considered yet like the repetitive member factor and some other things that I don't want to get to right yet so just be aware that if you're doing um, using visually graded decking again that's another just like we have posts and timbers beams and stern uh, beams and stringers dimensional lumber visually graded decking or just decking is another type of, another category of uh, sawn lumber product. So just uh, be aware of that, although it's not necessarily used in, it's not really used as part of an overall structural framework. It's more like a top level that gathers load. So I'm talking more, when I instruct, I'm talking more about like the, uh, for this course, I'm talking more about uh, elements that carry major structural loads. So, uh, and the major gravity and lateral force resisting systems of a structure. So I'm going to uh, skip over this uh, for this course, but you can certainly read up on that if you wish. Finally, there is one other table here, and this one is, um, I think, relatively straightforward. It's uh, To use this is exactly the same as the other tables we've discussed. Um, all this is is reference design values for non-North American um, visually graded dimensional lumber, two to four inches thick. So we're talking dimension lumber, or dimensional lumber, and we're talking about um, tree species that aren't very commonly sold commercially in the United States, or actually well, in North America, mainly U.S. and Canada, I think. Um, I don't know if Mexico uses the NDS. That's a question. I think the NDS is probably mainly uh, USA, but uh, that's actually something I'm curious about. If any countries outside the USA use the NDS, I'm not quite sure about that, actually. But again, my the philosophy on this has always been, on this course, has always been that I'm going to teach what I know, which is the U.S. system, and I'm sure there are other there are some differences between countries. But if you can learn the principles with one country system, I'm sure you can uh, look up the uh, the unique uh, codes and specifications for your own country and adjust as necessary for whatever standard your um, local systems use. But anyway, um, so uh, if you are in North America and you want to use uh, Norway spruce. Um, actually, uh, Finland here, Estonia, and Germany, I'm just going to skip. Oh, and here we go. Here's Norway spruce from Norway. Um, actually, a lot of ancestors in, from Norway uh, many, many years ago, back in the early 1900s. Oh, my goodness. Okay. The old country. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, Norway spruce, for example, if I, uh, for whatever reason, um, well, I guess my ancestors aren't entirely Norwegian, just uh, maybe a quarter or something Norwegian, but so... If I decided for whatever reason that I wanted to celebrate my ancestry and I was, uh, I insisted on having a new house that I was built uh, framed entirely in Norway spruce actually grown in Norway and I was willing to pay the outrageous sum to have it shipped all the way from Norway just to have it put into my house and then hidden behind drywall. I mean, if I want it, if you have enough money and you want it badly enough, you can get anything you want, I guess. Um, but uh, if I wanted to do that, I would then go to this table and uh, I would get those values. And these are the design values that I would use before applying relevant uh, adjustment factors that we'll discuss again in um, later videos. And I think that will that, that ends chapter uh, four. Uh, chapter five are more adjustment values. But that's where you're really getting into your glue lamb members and some other things. So we'll worry about that at a later part of the course. All right, so with that, we'll wrap up there for today. In review, today we thoroughly illustrated the process of finding reference design values for sawn lumber. 
The next lectures will start a series of explorations into the various adjustment factors used in the NBS, but that will do it for today. Today's music comes from the artist Cold Noise from the album Who We Are. A link is included in the video description. Hopefully you found this video informative and a bit enjoyable. If you did, please like and subscribe to make the YouTube robots happy. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you would like to help make content like this possible, please see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. Currently, we have two channel patrons, Edmund May and Logan Patrick, and I do want to just say thank you both for your generous support of this educational content. I am hoping to make this channel a more sustainable project long term, and relying on YouTube advertising it is inherently a fickle thing. I do give channel patrons a few uh, perks for supporting, including access to the production materials for this series. This includes slides, scripts, and SMATH calculation sheets. If that sounds like something you'd like to support, and you're fortunate enough in these uh, trying times, of course, to be able to do so, a link to our Patreon page can be found in the video description. Regardless, I hope you found this video useful, and I hope to see you again in the next lecture. I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.